Hello, Saddleback. You're too kind. Oops. Well, that's an inauspicious beginning, isn't it? It's really good to be with you. I want to start by praying for particularly for this message and for the way that, that God will speak to us as, as we talk together. Father, I pray that you would take everything that is said in this message. Some of it will be hard. Some of it will be difficult to hear. And I pray that we will hear it through the healthy parts of ourselves so that the unhealthy parts of ourselves can grow. I pray that you would protect those who have been damaged by terrible things that have been said to them through the years, incorrect things, things that have not been true about them, but they've caused damage. I pray, Father, that that will not be the lens that we listen through, but instead through the lens of a God who loves us. So I pray a protection over our minds and over our hearts and may the soil of our hearts be ready to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So last week, George and Tondra Gregory talked about how to build healthier, stronger relationships, stronger marriages. They talked about focusing on weeding, on getting rid of the things in our lives that cause problems, that keep us from growing. They had that beautiful analogy of a garden and um, and I want to continue that. I was so struck by what they said. I wanted to just kind of keep that theme going a little bit and talk about some practical ways that we can grow as individuals. But I want to start with just a review of what it is that God intends to do in our lives. What is it that he intends to do in all of us as Christ followers? So there on your outline, three verses to look at. The first thing is that God's goal in salvation is not only to save us from sin and separation from God, but to shape us into the image of Jesus. It says in Romans 8, 29a, for from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would, that they should become like his son, so that his son would be the first with many brothers. I want to tell you, even as we get going, there's going to be some things in some of these verses that you might look at and go, huh, what does that mean? And all I want to tell you is we can't cover it tonight, so you get to study on your own, but that's, that's part of the beauty of being a Christ follower is digging into the word to, on your own, checking out what is said. So just what I want you to catch in this one is that it says that God knew who, from the beginning who would come to him and that everyone who did, catch this, might underline this, should become like his son. And then 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, says therefore the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So those two passages tell us very clearly that God's intention all along has been that those who come to him should be made into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and that it's something that happens more and more over time. It's a process that's called sanctification. If you've taken foundations or you've been in church for any length of time, you know that that's the process by which God makes us holy. It's the process by which he makes us like himself. And it starts the moment we come to Christ, it will continue through our entire lives. In fact, it will take our entire lifetime to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God does this by working in us, by working deep within our personalities, deep within who we are, so that as we grow, we start reflecting the glory of God and Christ more and more and more every day. Some of the translations talk about from glory to glory, we are transformed. Well, what does it mean to be made into the image of Jesus? How do we know that we're being made into the image? How, do we, how can I see it in my life? How can I see that I'm actually changing and shifting and becoming more like Jesus? Well, there's a very good passage that gives us some proof that we need to look at and have as an evaluating stick, if you will, in front of us all the time. And that's Galatians 5.22. That passage says, in fact, read this out loud with me. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, 
He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you want to know that you are slowly over time being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus, being made more and more like him, there's your standard. There's your reference point. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit is in charge of us, when he is in charge of our lives, this is what he produces in us over time. The verse before that, a couple of verses before that are on the screen, and I want you to look at this with me because these verses show what happens when we are left to our own devices. When the Holy Spirit is not in control of me or not in control of you, this is instead what is produced in our lives. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. So the contrast is so clear. When we are in charge of our personalities, when we are in charge of ourselves, left to our own devices, we produce some pretty rotten fruit. But when the Holy Spirit is in charge of us, in charge of our personalities, over time, he makes us, slowly remakes us, so that what is produced in us is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I wrote this on your outline because this is, if you walk away from this message with nothing else but this statement, this will get at the heart of what it is I'm trying to say to you. When I am in control of my personality, I will leave damage in my wake. But when God is in control of my personality, I will leave blessing in my wake. That's what we all want. None of us want to damage people. None of us want to be the kind of folks that leave damage in our wake. We don't want to leave piles of broken people, broken relationships, shattered relationships behind us. None of us want to turn around and look back at our lives and see a trail of heartbreak and sadness and destruction that we have been a part of. We want to be able to look back behind us and see instead a trail of mostly blessing of the places where we loved, where we were kind, where we were joyful, where we were gentle, where we were patient with each other, where we showed goodness, where we exhibited self-control, where we were faithful. When I'm in charge of my life, I will do damage. When the Holy Spirit is in charge of my life and he is in a process of making me more and more like Jesus, I will leave blessing on the marks of those behind me. Well, but there's something that gets in the way. I mean, if we all, I think if we had the moment to talk with each other and have a cup of coffee, we would say, yeah, that's the kind of person I wanna be. Of course, I don't wanna be like that person who leaves damage behind me. I wanna be the person who leaves blessing and goodness in the lives of those around me. But what is it that gets in the way of that happening? And it gets in the way for all of us, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So I wanna start with a story. We'll sort of illustrate it for you. Um, my mom has Alzheimer's. I've talked to you about that. And Alzheimer's is a very cruel illness and she's in late stage Alzheimer's and she's in memory care. But like so much of what happens in life, even in our darkest moments, in darkest times, there's a little bit of humor. There's some funny things that happen even in our darkest moments. And so even in the sadness of Alzheimer's, there's some pretty funny things that happen. So a few weeks ago, I was at the memory care um, place where she lives, and um, we were just chatting, sitting in the little living room area, and a few of the other residents were sitting there with us. You know, everybody's kind of off in their own world, but all of a sudden, one of the other residents walked in, and Eleanor had on her blouse, she had on her jacket, 
she had on her socks, and she had on her shoes, but she did not have on her pants. And one of the residents said, Eleanor. And she said, what? And they said, you don't have on your pants. She goes, yes, I do. And they said, no, you don't. Eleanor, you do not have on your pants. And she's like, yes, I do. And all of a sudden now everyone is looking at her and they're all chiming in and they're going, Eleanor, you don't have your pants on. And she's getting louder and louder, insisting, yes, I do too have on my pants. And it took, you're not really laughing, this was hysterical. <laughs> I'm telling you it was hysterical. Um, so one of the caregivers very kindly walked over to Eleanor and said, honey, let me take you back to your room and I'll, I'll help you. We'll, we'll get this taken care of. We'll, we'll get your pants on. So all the way down to Eleanor's room, I hear her saying, I do too have my pants on. <laughs> you have to laugh. You have to laugh. But how many times am I like Eleanor? <laughs> How many times are you like Eleanor? The people closest to me, the people closest to you have said things to you about you, like, you don't have on any pants, and our response is, oh, yes, I do. And the truth is, she was very unhappy with everybody's evaluation of her. She did not like their evaluation. She didn't believe it. She didn't buy it. But it didn't really matter because they were right. She didn't have on any pants. And sometimes the people in our lives have tried to tell us things about ourselves. They've tried to tell us about the way that we relate. They've tried to tell us about the way that we make them feel. They've tried to tell us that maybe the way we're communicating isn't as effective as we think it is. They've tried to tell us about that habit. They've tried to tell us about our style of talking. And our response is, that is just not so. And we become like Eleanor, and the problem is that even though we don't like what they say, and we almost always disagree with what they say, many times the people closest to us are right, and we just don't want to hear it. Well, why does this happen to us? What, what is going on inside of us that creates this disconnect between the way other people see us and experience us and the way that we experience ourselves? Well, it's called a blind spot. And in our bodies, in the physical realm, we all have blind spots. If you have a phone, I want you to, you know, we have a little technology challenge here. Go to saddleback.com forward slash blind spot. Watching online, if you're here, because what I want you to do is I want you to cover your left eye, all right, everybody? Cover your left eye once you've gotten it. And you're gonna have to hold, and there's a little X. There's like a, a plus sign, and then there's a circle over on the right that's dark. The blind spot that you and I have within our eyes, where our eyes don't have cones and rods, and they don't, so it doesn't receive it. If you cover your left eye, hold it out here, and then slowly keep staring at that plus sign. Just keep staring at that plus sign. Don't move from that. And eventually, as it gets about right here, the circle on your right is gonna disappear. It's the most amazing thing. If you don't try it in here, try it at home. Because it is the reality. Our bodies have a space within us, in our eyes, in which we have blind spots. That's what happens to us when there's cars beside us. They, they enter into this space next to us where we don't have the right vision. And so it not only happens in our physical world, but it happens to us emotionally. And emotionally, there can be a disconnect, a very profound disconnect between the way other people experience us and the way that we experience ourselves. The reason is, because we are blind. That's just all there is to it. The reason for the disconnect is we are blind. We have blind spots. And a definition of a blind spot is places in our personality where we lack clarity, insight, and awareness of ourselves and our patterns of reacting and relating in life. Just like we all have physical blind spots, we have emotional blind spots, every single one of us. Nobody is immune to them, nobody's above them, nobody's so spiritually mature that they never have a blind spot anymore. And you can identify a blind spot within yourself right now 
really sincerely, just kind of think back over your life and think about the messages that you have had, the repeated arguments, the same conversation over and over where someone tries to point something out and your response to it is, nope, don't see it, not see it, can't see it. But those same arguments come up, not just with this one person. If it's a blind spot, it'll affect nearly every relationship you have. In some way, that blind spot in you will start to show itself in all the relationships in your life, or at least most of them. Paul David Tripp says that we are blind to our own blindness. And even when you have these flashes of insight, maybe you're in a... In an, in an argument or you're in a deep conversation with somebody and and you get this flash of insight and and there's a little bit of you that resonates with what that other person is saying and and there's this moment where you go, oh, well, well, maybe, maybe I'm like that. If you don't really get serious about it, that's all it will ever be is a flash. It will just be a glimpse into your true self, but if you don't take it seriously, you don't decide to do something about it, then it will be gone and you will remain blind to your own blindness. C.S. Lewis wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia in the last of the seven books, The Last Battle. And he talks in there in The Last Battle about um, how the true king has come. There's been this very fierce battle and now he's getting ready to restore Narnia, make it what it, it always was supposed to be. And there's a group of dwarves and um, they're sitting huddled together in a very dark and dank stable. Some of the other characters walk up to where the dwarves are huddled in this very dark, stinky stable. And as the story goes, the dwarves start looking at each other. They're very grumpy and they look at each other and go, do you hear somebody talking? I think I hear somebody talking. And the other characters are like, yes, we're here, we're here. Can't you see us? And the dwarves are going, I feel like there are people talking, but I can't see them. Do you see anybody? And the other characters are going, hello, we're here. Hello, don't you see us? And the dwarves are continuing to say, I keep hearing voices, but I can't see anything. And and at one point, the characters look at the dwarves and say, well, can't you see that we're in this beautiful space where there's trees and flowers and there's stream? And the dwarves respond by saying, how could you possibly say this dark stable is beautiful? And then the characters getting a little frustrated realize they can't see. And they say to them, well, here, let me, let, me, let me show you. And they reach in to touch one of the dwarves, and the dwarf responds by saying, ah, don't hit me. And the other person's like, I, I didn't hit you. I was just touching you. And then they realize, well, maybe if I let you smell the flowers, maybe you'll realize then that you're in a beautiful place, that you're really not inside a dark stable. You're, you're sitting out here with the rest of us. And so they pick some flowers and they try to give them to the dwarf and the dwarf hits them away and says, why would you give me something that smells of a horse? And the other characters are getting so frustrated and they ask Aslan, who represents God, and they said, can't you help them? Can't you help them see They can't see. And so Aslan tries one more time and spreads a banquet before the dwarves. And the dwarves pick it up and they eat it, but they think that they're just eating straw and drinking dirty water. And they're so upset. And one of the characters finally says, Aslan, why can't they see? And he says, because they don't want to. They have chosen not to see. And if you and I are not careful with the glimpses that God gives us of insight into our personalities, insight into our blind spots, insight into the way that there are things that we need to change and be different, we will eventually lose our ability to see. In fact, it's there on your outline. Over time, if we keep choosing not to see, we will no longer be able to see. If we don't let those flashes of insight bring us to that place where God can transform us, where God can do his work in making us more and more like Jesus, and we will continue to choose not to see, we will lose our ability to see our own lives clearly. So we're blind. We have blind spots. 
But why would any of us choose blindness over sight? Why would anybody choose to be blind rather than have insight and awareness and knowledge? Why would we choose it? Why do we persist in refusing to see the truth about ourselves? Why don't we learn from our mistakes and, and seek change, seek the freedom from our prisons? Why do we persist in being like Eleanor? Why do we keep insisting that we have pants on? Why do we insist like the dwarves that we're sitting in a dark, dank stable being given straw and dirty water instead of recognizing we are sitting in the beauty of a world that Aslan or God has created? Why are we so blinded by our blind spots? Well, I have about six reasons quickly that, I wanna, that I've discovered in my own life, and I think they're probably true for many of you. The first is pain. Listen, it hurts. It's excruciating to get a good look at yourself sometimes. It's excruciatingly painful to realize that I'm not nearly as nice as I like to think I am, that I'm not nearly as kind as I think I am, that I'm not nearly as sensitive as I think I am, that I'm not as good a listener as I think I am. When someone else points out to me the places where I'm not as strong, good, kind, whatever as I think I am, man, it hurts. It hurts badly. So it's pretty natural. Most of us don't like pain. Another reason is because of pride. You know what? Just unadulterated pride. It hurts our ego to realize that we're not who we always think we are, or who we'd like to be. You know, through the years here at Saddleback and years of public speaking in other places, I mean, we've received our fair share of criticism and most of the time I can just kind of go, you know, I don't pay too much attention to it, it doesn't bother me. But the closer you get to me, the closer you are in that circle of intimacy, the people that are the dearest to me, um, you know, when those people have a word to say to me, um, it's harder for me to accept their evaluation of my blind spots. And if I'm not careful, I can just be like a little third grader and go, well, yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah, but what about you? Yeah, you know, like, well, maybe I am, but what about you? You know, and whenever we have that kind of a response, anybody else do that in your relay? Am I the only one that has that prideful three, third grader Think, Come on. Yes, somebody ever have done that? You know, somebody tells you something and you're like, well, you know, yeah, but what about you? You do this. Um, there's just, and that's just pride. Recognize it for what it is. Third thing that I think keeps us choosing blindness over sight is fear. Honestly, there are some points in my life where I've been able to consider the rational possibility that there might be something true to what you are saying, but I don't know what to do about it. Let's just say you're right. I don't always know what to do about it. I don't necessarily know how to be different. I don't know how to change. And I start feeling like it's all on my shoulders and I don't know how to do it any other way. And I'm afraid to hear what you have to say. Another reason is laziness. You know what? It's hard work to change. It's hard work to change. It takes a lot of effort. And if we were going to really be honest, some of us have responded to those kind of conversations with our loved ones, our friends, our coworkers, our family, small group members with a, man, that's, that's a lot of work. I, I've been this way a long time. You know what? I, I've been this way a long time. I don't, I don't really know that, that I can change that. I, I mean, it sucks to be you to have to deal with me, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable with the way I am. I'm comfortable with my brokenness. I'm comfortable with the way that I deal with the world. And you know what? Sorry, just lazy. Another one is stubbornness. And this is more from not lazy, as much of a just a refusal. Rebellion. Nope. Nope. Not going to listen. Not going to change. No. That's rebellious. Better be careful about that one. And then the one that we don't always talk about, but I've come to understand even more and more true in our lives, is trauma. Trauma is another reason 
why we sometimes choose blindness over sight. Because unfortunately, we've all been wounded in some ways by our families that we grew up in, by former marriage, former boyfriend or girlfriend, former friendship. All of us have been wounded and damaged by other people. And some of that has created a distorted mirror so that when we hear criticism or when we hear somebody talking to us about a blind spot, we hear it through that distorted lens. We hear it through that distorted voice of somebody who heaped a lot of garbage on us. And that garbage, that untruth, that, that unkindness, that abuse has actually changed our mirror. And so we're not really good at hearing those kind of things because it gets all twisted up inside of us. And we'll talk about what to do about that in a minute. This next part is, is, <laughs> is hard because I felt like the Lord asked me to be just really honest with you. I try to be honest with you anytime I speak, but you know what? Sometimes he asks me to be even more honest and more revealing. Um, and some of you might make you a little uncomfortable too, you know, because you have us up on this little pedestal like Rick and I are perfect and our family's perfect and we never argue and we never get mad and we never sin and, you know, please hang around me for five minutes and I can, I can, get, I can get rid of that one for you really fast. Um, <laughs> But the truth is, I, I have a really strong personality. I have a really strong personality. A sentence that I have been told my whole life, my entire life is, man, you're intense. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a lot. I'm an introvert, and I even have a little bit of social anxiety. But my basic personality is pretty much lead, follow, or get out of my way, because I'm coming. And one of the other phrases that I've heard a few times more than I'd like to admit is, Whew, don't want to be on the wrong side of Kay. <laughs> I like her, but I don't want to be on the wrong side of her. Yeah. So I'm going to share with you some things that have been said to me in the last month by people who know me really well, and they all love me. So nothing that, that I'm going to tell you was said in unkindness or anger or cruelty or anything else. These were things that I had to pay attention to. Recently, uh, Rick and I had one of those, uh, as George and Tondra called, intense conversations. <laughs> we had a very intense conversation. And um, as, as we kind of moved from the conflict stage to the resolution stage, really listening to each other, hearing each other, and, and he could sense that I genuinely wanted to hear truth from him. Very gently, he said to me, honey, you can't see what I see. You just don't realize the impact of your actions and your words. You don't realize how ingrained some of your behavior and your reactions really are, how automatic, how pervasive they are, and how destructive it can be if you're not paying attention. Someone else I love said to me, do you realize how passive aggressive you can be when you're angry? My response was, oh, I'm not. <laughs> Someone else said to me, I just don't think you're aware of how intense you are. You think you're just having a conversation with me, but I feel like you're really angry. No, I'm not. Someone else said, talking about somebody that we both knew, you know, he's a little bit afraid of you. <laughs> My reaction, good. <laughs> I want him to be a little afraid of me. <laughs> and it shocked me to realize that those words were the first thing that came out of my mouth. 
And I realized I was actually kind of happy to know that this guy was a little bit afraid of me because it meant I had some power in this situation and it meant that I could get what I wanted. He was gonna work hard to get my expectations met. Ooh. And somebody else I really love said, you know, I am trying really hard, but I don't know how to please you. That's why I'm a little bit shaken, actually. I'm shaking inside as I approach this message because since January 8th of this year, I didn't do January 1st on, you know, intentions. I was like seven days late, but oh well. It was still January, so it counts. So January 8th of 2019, I sat down with the Lord and I said, God, my prayer is going to be every day this year, show me my blind spots. Every day this year, my prayer is going to be, show me my blind spots. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the person who leaves damage in her wake. I want to be the person who leaves blessing by and large in her wake. And God, you are going to have to show me my blind spots. And since January 8th of this year, I have been praying that prayer every day. And I've decided it's the stupidest prayer I have ever prayed <laughs> because I am miserable and I hate it. <laughs> And I feel like Jack Nicholson, a few good men, is like, God's saying, you can't handle the truth. And I'm like, yes, you're right, I can't handle the truth. <laughs> Don't feel too sorry for me. The two passages that God has just immersed me in since January 8th. First is Psalm 19, 12 to 14. It's David's prayer when he had just blown it so badly. And he says, how can I know the sins lurking in my heart through the lens of a blind spot? This needs to be our prayer. How can I know the sins that are lurking in my heart? God, cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sin, the ones that I know I'm doing. So keep me from those hidden faults of blind spots and keep me from the deliberate sin. Don't let them control me. And then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth, the things that actually come out of my mouth, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, the secret things that you don't know, I'm thinking, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Oh, Lord, my rock and my salvation. And then Matthew 7, 1 to 5. <laughs> Don't criticize. And then you won't be criticized. For others will treat you as you treat them. And why worry about a speck in the eye of a brother when you, K. Warren, have a board in your own? Should you say, friend, let me help you get that speck out of your eye when you can't see because of the board in your own? Hypocrite. He's not shouting that. It's kind of a gentle thing. Hypocrite. First, get rid of the board. And then you can see to help your brother or sister. And the visual that I have in my mind is because it's a blind spot, because I can't see often that I have a board, a two by four in my eye. I have this visual of I'm walking through life with a giant two by four sticking out of my eye. And because I'm blind to it and I don't realize it, every time I hurt, turn my head, I'm whacking somebody with that board. I don't know, I can't, I, people are falling all around me. Why, where, why are they falling down? It's because I have a board, I've got a two by four in my eye and I can't see it. And so every move, every interaction in some ways if I'm not careful is hurting other people. And yet, I'm happy to deal with a little bit of sawdust in your eye. I'm happy to deal with a little bit of sawdust in, the, um, in my coworker's eye or my husband's eye or my kid's eye or in the checker at Target's eye or in the customer servant's agent on the phone or the driver who cut me off or the politicians that are driving me batty. I mean, I am so happy to deal 
with the sawdust in everybody else's eye while I am maintaining a board in my own. Well, the responses to a blind spot, I, I can think of three right off the bat. You can first, you can just reject it, truly. You can just reject it. Somebody comes to you, they tell you something about yourself that you very much don't want to hear, that you very much don't like, that you very much disagree with. You can keep insisting you're wearing pants all the rest of your life. You can just flat out reject it. Second thing is you can, it's a little bit, this second one's a little better, you can acknowledge it. And, and you can try to stop the bad behavior. You're producing bad fruit, and you go, okay, all right, I will stop that behavior. And it's right there on the surface. That's, that's better than rejecting it. It's just dealing kind of with the bad fruit. Or you can acknowledge it and let God root it out. Let him get in there and root out the cause. See, your friends and your family members can see the bad fruit in your life. It's not hidden. They get it. You don't have the pants on. They see it, and they can point it out. And when they point it out, they can see it, and they can tell you, man, you are messing up. You are blowing it here. You are hurting me. You're hurting other people. You are producing bad fruit. And they can see that. But what they can't always see is the root. They can't see why you're doing that. They can't see what it is that's keeping you in that place, but God can. And that's why it's not good enough to just deal with, the, okay, I'll stop doing X, Y, Z. No, bring it to God. Take it that one step further. Let it go down into that transformational place where God can actually remake you and your character more and more like Jesus Christ. That's God's part. God, my part is to recognize, ask God for vision to see, and then recognize it and accept it when I see it. Bring it to him and say, God, man, I don't like this stinky fruit I'm producing. I don't like it. Show me where it's coming from. Help me root it out so that I am transformed. So how can we learn to accurately see ourselves? Four things. First, know Believe and accept that I am God's beloved. Know and believe and accept that I am God's beloved. Romans 8 verse 1 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who belong to Christ Jesus, even as you are flawed, even as I am flawed and marred by sin and great failure and terrible mistakes and I'm producing stinky fruit and, and the sins of others and all of that has impacted me and left me imperfect and broken and wounded and incomplete. The good news of this is none of that affects his love for me. I don't have to be spiritually mature for God to love me. I don't have to be spiritually perfect. I don't have to be spiritually mature and complete for God to love me. He loves me. He loves me. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. The verses before this in Romans 7 talk about how Paul says, listen, I, I am such a mess. Paul says, I am such a mess in Romans 7. What's the hope for me? What possible hope for me? And he says, well, the answer is Jesus Christ, my Lord. And then chapter 8, verse 1 carries it on further. So now, because the answer is Jesus Christ, because he knows you, he loves you, he's bought and paid for your salvation, because he's so passionate about you, you are his beloved, because of that, there's no condemnation. Then you need to look at an accurate mirror. Because looking at an accurate mirror will counter some of the defensiveness that we bring to this topic and will also counter some of the damage that was done by trauma. In James 1, 22 to 25, there's only a little bit of, on your outline, so most of it is, is on the screen. So I want you to look at the screen version of this. James 1, 22 to 25, talking about the word of God as a mirror that we look at and see ourselves and see life and see all of, all of our existence. And remember, it is a message to obey, not just to listen to. So don't fool yourselves. For if a person just listens and doesn't obey, 
He is like a person looking at his face in a mirror, and as soon as he walks away, he can't see himself anymore anymore, or remember what he looks like. But if anyone keeps looking steadily into God's law for free men, free people, he will not only remember it, but he will do what it says, and God will greatly bless him in everything he does. We are instructed to steadily, steadily, constantly, never stopping, look in true, into the true mirror. And God's word is true. It will reveal the truth to us, not what other people have said, not what other people believe about you, but what God knows. And in that place of knowing that we're his beloved and we're forgiven and his grace for us never stops and that he wants to change us and that he will make us more and more like the son. When we steadily look into that accurate mirror of God's word, then, then we understand that his correction comes to us from love. Revelation 3, 17 and 18. This is Jesus talking to one of the churches in, um, in, in Revelation. He says, you say, I'm rich. I've got everything I want. I don't need a thing. And, my paraphrase, because you have blind spots, you don't realize that spiritually you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. My advice to you, Jesus says, is, is to buy pure gold from me, gold purified by fire, because only then will you be rich, and to purchase from me white garments, clean and pure, so that you won't be naked and ashamed, and to get medicine from me to heal your eyes and give you back your sight. The truth is, because we are God's beloved, because he says, come to me, let me be the one that heals you. Let me be the one that shows you the truth about yourself. When you do that, when we come to him like that, then it gets rid of that fear in us that, you know what? Yeah, my whole life I've been told I'm just a big piece of poo. Everything that everybody has ever said about me is true. And if anybody ever really got, if they knew me, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't care about me. No, when Jesus says, you think that you've got it all together. You think that you're rich, that you've got all everything your needs met, but really you're poor and you're blind and you're wretched and you're naked. Jesus does not say that with disdain. His is the one voice, the one voice that sees us exactly as we are and loves us exactly as we are. His is the one voice that we can absolutely trust. He never ever corrects us with scorn or disdain or with anger. He sees that we are wounded and miserable and longs for us to be healed and to be whole and to be made right in his love. And by his grace and his deep love, we need to thank him for letting us see ourselves in that true light. What we really are, how we really behave, that is actually a gift from God to see, to see clearly and to know that he loves us. Third thing to do is to examine your relationships for patterns of behavior. Examine your relationships for patterns of behavior. If the first two things, know and accept and believe that you are God's beloved, go to his word for an accurate mirror, an accurate picture of you, those are internal things. This is an external thing. This is something now you start spreading the love around and you start examining all the relationships, those especially those closest to you, for the typical interactions that you have with the people closest to you and see if there are repeated interactions where you guys get stuck every time, where the same things are said, where the same accusations are leveled at you, where the same comments are made over and over and over again, and see if there are some things that you've been denying. Because you know what, my friends? The old adage of, if it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, and it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck holds true here. Here's the thing. I've discovered in this process since January 8th, 2019, 
that it is far easier for me to accept God's evaluation of myself. It's so much easier for me to be reading the word or listening to a message or listening to a podcast or being in a Bible study or being in small group and something is said and I'm reading it and I go, yes, God, thank you for that spiritual insight. You are right. That's true about me. That's true. That is me. And I need to change it. Oh, God. And it, it is hard and it's hard work, but I accept it. You know why? Because God's perfect. And so when the perfect judges me, the imperfect, I can accept that because he's perfect. He's going to get it right. And he knows me. But you are the imperfect judging me, the imperfect. And what right do you have as the imperfect to judge me? Because you know what? You don't see it all. You don't know how hard I've been trying. You don't know where I've been working on this. You don't know how many times I could have done it this way and I didn't. You don't know how many times I zipped my lip. You don't know all the things that wounded me. You don't know. You only know half the story. And so your judgments of me often feel, ah, that's hard. And I just wish that God would just let me read the word and be corrected that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. We do need each other. And when you... Start looking at your relationships through the lens of God. <laughs> Where have I been blind? He will talk to you. Here's the questions you need to ask yourself. What am I pretending not to know? Every time I ever hear anybody say that, it's like, okay, that's all I need. I'm going home because I got to just think about that one. What is it that I'm pretending not to know? What am I pretending is not a problem? But it is, and we all know it. What am I pretending that I've overcome. Oh, well, yes, I used to struggle with that, but that is behind me. That is in my past. I am no longer that way. What is it you're pretending that you have overcome and you haven't? What is it that you think you're good at, but others tell you you're not? Like, I really think I'm a good listener. And my family points out to me sometimes, you're not as good as you think you are. So what is it, where is it that you think I am a kind person, I am a loving person, I am a generous person, I'm a calm person, I'm gonna fill in the gaps, but everybody else around you, especially those in those closest relationships, would have a different story to tell. And the biggie, what is it like on the other side of me? What is it like to be on the other side of me? Listen, you guys, if you will apply these questions to your relationships, some things will change, some things will budge, some of the stuck, blind places will begin to change because you cannot honestly ask those questions. What am I pretending not to know? What am I pretending is not a problem? What am I pretending I'm over? What am I pretending I'm better at than I really am in relationships? And what is it like on the other side of me? You cannot honestly ask those questions and not be changed. You will begin to change. And the last thing is to establish a daily practice of humility before God. Establish a daily practice of humility before God. Begin to do every day as you spend some time in the Lord's presence, God, I don't want to be blind. I don't want to be blind. Help me not to be blind to my own blindness and I am willing to do whatever it takes for you to show me myself accurately and resolve that because of God's grace and his beautiful love for you, that you will live as openly as you can, inviting, inviting, inviting that kind of evaluation that says, you know what? What don't I know that I should know? What is it that you've tried to tell me and I've never been willing to see and establish a daily time of confession and maybe it would be good for you to read Psalm 51 where David had sinned his greatest sin committed adultery committed made sure somebody was murdered because of it terrible sin maybe this could be your daily prayer it's mine have mercy on me O oh God because of your unfailing love. In fact, I'd like for you just to close your eyes and just listen. Have mercy on me, O oh God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. 
For I recognize, I recognize my shameful deeds and they haunt me day and night against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but, but you desire honesty from my heart so that you can teach me to be wise in my inmost being. God, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You've broken me. Now let me rejoice. God, don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. You would not be pleased with sacrifices or I would bring them. If I brought you a burnt offering, you would not accept it. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart, O oh God, you will not despise. <laughs> 